Grief is a thin place, a place so thin it's hard to tell where earth ends and heaven begins. Grief is a place so thin that it's where the living and the dead feel one another's love. I'm the Reverend Lisa Hamilton, and I grieve. First, I'll read a scripture appointed for today, then I'll struggle with those words through the lens of grief. I'm glad you've joined me. Today's scripture is Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and verses 16 through 20. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, offspring who do evil, children who deal corruptly, who have forsaken the Lord, who have despised the Holy One of Israel, who are utterly estranged. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, let's argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Good Lord, O oh Lord. Good Lord. Nowadays, this is what we'd call a prosperity gospel. You know, the idea that if we're good, we'll get what we want. The good are rewarded, the bad are punished. Never mind that we're all people who do things that are both good and bad, both wise and foolish. You hear this all the time in statements like, anyone can be a success in this country if they just stay in school and stay off drugs. Statements like this forget that not everybody avoids freak accidents and unpredictable diseases, that not everybody has clean and sober parents, that not everybody has a functional IQ, that not everybody has the full belly, the clean water, the love, the luck, and the encouragers to just stay in school and stay off drugs. So when I find this attitude in the Bible, in churches, in people, I feel angry because no amount of prosperity gospel or any other gospel for that matter stops funerals from coming. Doesn't even stop the funerals for the people who were lucky enough to die after a lifetime of health that includes the grandchildren who gather at their deathbed. This attitude that everything is in our control sets us up for death as our failure. And death is either your failure, God, or it's a transition that calls your kindness into question. When my son Ted was not yet declared legally dead, but lay in a hospital with no signs of life, Mary, the beloved and wonderful babysitter who had seen, his through, seen us through his dad's death 25 years earlier, visited. As I dozed one night, she kept vigil. I would open my eyes and see her hovering with love, holding his hand, praying in whispers, begging you, begging Ted, begging his dad to please, please, please let this 27-year-old, beautiful, compassionate, creative boy of your creation to just live, to be a miracle to bring his mix of wise and foolish, of stupid and smart, of good luck and no luck at all, to pour into love for his grandchildren. Mary and I had prayed the same when Ted's dad, Scott, battled cancer as he turned 32. We lived with the cancer diagnosis for eight months and four days, about the length of time we knew we were pregnant with Teddy but Scott's cancer diagnosis ended in death instead of in life. 
so in that hospital room. When Mary burst out to me, I don't understand why you can't get a miracle. I looked at her across the tubes and machines and blinking lights and flat lines, and I said to her in all sincerity, Oh, Mary, there's no greater miracle than eternal life. I meant it then, but now I want to barf. Ted had no descendants. Scott has no descendants, and I have none. Again and again, I have learned how thin the veil is. But again and again, I learn how the veil, on this side anyway, is woven with a warp of pain and a weft of tears. The veil is thin, and it is not predictable, and it hurts. And yet, the veil is all that separates we living from our beloved dead. Grief is a thin place.